before about that folk element. I mean, this is take, taken immediately from, from that playbook. Um, the very heavy, ponderous, you know, slugging through the mud. And uh, and then you have some very beautiful singing-like or song-like uh, chords. Yeah, everybody's right. Everybody's running around. Where was the cow? Hello, welcome to And If Love Remains. Thanks for listening to this podcast. My name is Mike Levitt, and I am again joined by Dr. Elias Axel Patterson. We are continuing our journey and exploration of pictures at an expedition. And uh, very thrilled to, to continue this. This is actually part three of a series, and, and we may go into a part four. We're going to see how this goes. We likely will go into a part four. But uh, uh, I am I'm thrilled to continue this, this, uh, the story of this piece. Um, a little bit about Elias. Um, first of all, lo- listen to the past episodes. You're going to hear a little bit about his background. You also, um, where he came from, you also hear a little bit about um, the the beginnings of, of this piece and, and kind of the 30,000 foot overview. Um, also, um, I, I do want to mention that he is um, a concert pianist. He's a Mason Hamlin artist, concert artist. Um, he also uh, started his own piano festival, the Southwest mm-hmm. Piano Festival in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Is that the right name of it, Elias? That's correct, yes. Fabulous. Got that one right. And then okay. we're all, and he also is affiliated with um, the Arizona Piano Institute, which I've been, um, luckily been able to be, uh, oh, you've been a part, a of, part of, and it's been, it is a fabulous, uh, institute, a, a place for, for, uh, um, uh, talented young artists to, to learn and, and grow. And I, I also have to mention one thing. And, uh, and I, I say this as, as the highest of compliments I could give is I have, allowed him to uh, do master classes with my students. And that has been a thrill for me and for them. So mm-hmm. I appreciate all the time that Elias has, has put in with, with us. And, and I'm grateful for this. Again, we're going to continue with this story. And, and again, to kind of go back um, and get a full overview of the piece, um, you know, go back and listen to these past episodes, uh, part one and part two. Um, we just finished up um, – and help me with the French again. The tw- <laughs> Tuileries, yeah. Tuileries. We just finished up talking about the Tuileries, which is a delightful little vignette. And mm-hmm. and we um, and so we start into this very different sounding, the Bijou. So let's talk about that. Sure. Yes. So Tuileries is, um, you know, we just finished that very lighthearted. You know, we have all the kids playing in the in the gardens with the French nannies, most likely. As we know, you know, Russia was heavy, heavily influenced by French culture. French was the main main language. Um, as we move into Bidouo, we notice another one of the main, um, I guess, uh, cultures of the area, certainly Poland. Uh, and we also have to keep in mind in the 1800s that these national boundaries that we know of today were not the same. Uh, like right. My great-grandparents actually come from areas surrounding Kiev and Minsk. And, you know, today I would say, oh, Kiev, the, you know, Ukraine. But at the time, it might not, not, not have been uh, Ukraine. It might have been owned partly by Russia uh, or some empire thereof or a Polish prince or king or whatever. Those, those cities and towns switched alliances and, uh, quite frequently. But anyway, uh, Musrovsky was heavily influenced by that culture. And hence the title is in the original Polish uh, with the L with a slash through it is the W. Um, and so... This piece is very serious, very ponderous. It is basically the uh, the ox cart, you know, Bidwo's cattle or oxen. And okay. uh, walking through the mud, you know, you hear these huge chords at the beginning, bum, 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 bum. Yes. And uh, something that we alluded to a little bit in our previous discussions, and certainly we'll talk about more, are the changes that Rimsky-Korsakov made and subsequently other composers like Ravel uh, used those changes uh, Bidwo is one of the prime examples where uh, Musrovsky starts with a fortissimo chord uh, at the beginning in G sharp minor. So we're going from B, B major basically to, to G sharp minor. Um, and 
he uh, Rimsky Korsakov changes that to a piano, which is very effective. And certainly, when you hear the orchestration, you hear this kind of entering oxen cart being pulled from a distance, you know, coming into focus. Right. But um, I think Mussorgsky's idea of this stark contrast between the Tuileries and the Biduo immediately, you know, in your face. I think that has another kind of, um, I don't know, meaning to it. And maybe there was something in the gallery, you know, back to uh, har- harkening back to Hartman's gallery, you know, this huge exhibition. Um, obviously, this is pictures at an exhibition. So one of maybe uh, one wall separated the uh, Tuileries from the Biduo image. And, you know, you're, you're just hit in the face with this. But I mean, there are many ways to interpret that. Well, it's but also think, interesting because there isn't a promenade in between. I think this is the first time in, in pictures that there isn't a promenade. You, you just do the Tuileries and then your Tuileries and then you're right into the Bidro. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Yeah, it's, it's such a stark contrast and you're, you're thrust into this um, into this vignette so quickly. Um, and yeah, maybe that's the point of not having a uh, promenade between. And so... Uh, I love this piece. It uh, it has really two different characteristics in it: the the really heavy heaviness, the pesante, and we've talked before about that folk element. I mean, this is take, taken immediately from the, from that playbook. Um, the very heavy, ponderous, you know, slugging through the mud, mm-hmm. and uh, and then you have some very beautiful singing like or song like uh, chords. Da, 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 da. Uh, very beautiful, kind of over the countryside. Maybe there's hope. Maybe this uh, this man or farmer who is taking his oxen to market to pick up something. Maybe there's some hope for his life. Well, uh, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that. That that makes sense to me. And just uh, from a cultural background, there's a um, so. Uh, the church I belong to is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, and we have a, a pioneer tradition, and and with that comes this ox cart tradition. And it, it's funny. There's this. There's a song I learned as a kid. It was um, called uh, "Pioneer Children Sang as They Walk," and it's it's funny because everybody makes fun of it in our church because it's it's uh, you know it, it's slow. It almost slows down. Pioneer children sang as they walked and walked. And walk. Oh, that's and, cool. Anyway, it's talking about the uh, all these ox, but I can see the the, you know, with these pioneers um, traveling over the Americas, trying to find a new home, trying to find a place of their own. And and I don't know the whole history of of what's going on, you know, with um, Bidwell, but I can imagine in my mind a similar thing where you say there's hope uh, in the future, and that's really what pioneers, that's what farmers, that you know, they're. They're, they're planting now, not for them. They're planting for generations to come. Right, yeah. I mean, I, I come from both sides of my families are farmers. My father's side in Sweden, um, when we would go visit that family, it's, we'd stay on my – well, it was my grandfather's farm. Then it was handed down to the eldest son. Now, actually, he's passed away, my uncle. And it's his son, right. who's my cousin, who owns the farm. So third generation. And then he has some kids, too, that would be fourth generation. And, uh, and then in my mom's family as well in the Midwest, Iowa, you know, farmers. And uh, that's what it is. You're, the, the idea um, is planting for the future. Actually, you were, you were speaking about uh, Latter-day Saints, you know, Mormonism. And I'm actually from the Jewish tradition. And we have a, a holiday, well, a number of holidays celebrating a spring and planting and whatnot. Um, sure, yeah. We, we have things like uh, Sukkot, you know. But there's a holiday for just planting trees. And... <laughs> Uh, that's that's very important. The the concept of, you know, why are you planting this? It's not going to help you. It's uh, well it's for my grandkids, kind of thing.
And right. I like how in your song, the walking part, uh, you know, it actually gets slower. And we have some of those in Hebrew as well. Some songs uh-huh. that kind of follow that that vocal or that speech pattern. Um, I think Musorgsky, like I mentioned before, along with Janacek, is very good at translating speech into music. And not that there would be words to this piece, but I think he, if words were to be put to it, uh, it's very and uh, it's very idiomatic for the voice. And he kind of does introduce a little bit of that rubato feel um, naturally. And so he had a really uh, quite a penchant for writing for the voice, and he really got that across in this piece. Um, and I'm trying to think did what he, else. Did he do in, in his other works? Did he do I, – he did an opera, I believe. Did he do other works for voice? Yeah, he did a couple. So um, Hovashina is – I'm not saying it exactly correctly. And um, what is the other one? Boris Godunov is his big opera. Very, it's, Those are very heavy operas, and their uh, register – is more in the bass and the baritone section, but he featured mm. that more than the Italian operas where you might have, or French operas, you know, it's more light, airy, right. and more featuring tenor, soprano, etc. But um, yeah, he did write a lot. And then he wrote some incredible song cycles. Uh, what is the one I I played the song with? Uh, son, I, I can't remember it right now. Uh, I'll look it up. But um, song cycle. yeah, they're beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me see. Sunless. That's it. It's the Sunless song cycle, uh, and those are beautiful. So he he really oh, wow. did quite a bit for voice, um, voice and piano, op- operatic stuff, and well, uh, and, song and, and composers. Uh, you know that that kind of goes into translating into to other cultures too. I, I feel like composers, um, like Musorsky, like like Dvorak, who are fab Mozart, who are fabulous. Mm-hmm songwriters like their their melodies are transcendent they're beautiful and and really do um uh you know transfer from culture to culture and from 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 time to time in a way mm-hmm. yeah yeah those germanic ones too schubert i mean he wrote i don't know oh, how yeah. many leader over 600 or something like that uh but you can see that in their piano writing as well um, two things I want to mention about this piece as well, which ties into what I did in, in a lot of pieces in this particular recording. So uh, one thing is a compositional thing. We talked about Mutrovsky being the sort of maverick, not having the conservatory training, breaking some of the dramatic rules. Uh, there are tons of you know uh, parallel octaves in this. That's going to happen when you double a voice. But not only that, the, the filling in of certain chords and parallel fifths, uh, there's a lot of that in here. So this piece can be shown as an example of not a good student uh, submission. You know, if you were at a conservatory and you sent this in, he, he probably would have gotten bad marks um, just from a right. composition standpoint. The other thing I wanted to mention is the recording that you're using for this, I recorded in, in Banff in 2006 and released in 2007. So that, and I had only played it for a couple of professors at the time. One I mentioned, Sergei Babayan, and that was probably the largest influence. After that, I went to uh, Montreal for my doctoral degree and studied with a phenomenal Canadian pianist, Paul Stewart, who has you know quite a legacy himself. He he studied with Michelangeli and Guido Augusti and and uh, wow. what's his name, Kendall Taylor, who has a Beethoven edition, London a British uh, pianist, and then Charles Reiner, who is the the son or the nephew or something of uh, Fritz Reiner, a famous conductor in, uh, in Chicago. In any case, I studied with Paul, and he was my thesis advisor on this work, and I performed this piece much for him, and I, I played it for my second doctoral recital, I believe, and I re- okay. recorded it then as well. So I, I, the reason I'm bringing that up is that a lot of the my interpretation of it changed with him, and a lot right. of the excesses that I was adding, you know, I was being influenced by Horowitz and, uh, but, you know, uh, when, I, when I started playing this, and I was adding things uh, such as in Bidwo, I was adding the fillers to a lot of these open chords. So he might do open octaves or, or maybe a fifth in the middle, and I was filling in the third. So it was oh. richer. And I felt that, you know, that's we can get into the question of whether or not that's being true to the composer, which I mentioned right. previously that I want to do. But it's um, I think that it was really lending to his uh, character that he was trying to 
to illuminate. So add, adding the third or, or, or adding the third. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. adding the third, making the chords. So he was marking fortissimo, and I was adding thirds in there to make the chords richer. Right. And um, I added things in Tuileries. I added a couple little ornaments, some little nachschlags before before the notes, which you'll hear in the recording. And when I re-recorded it and re-performed performed it again in, uh, when did I do that other, maybe 2009, uh, I took a lot of those excesses out because I felt uh, they maybe they weren't being true and I could still have the same effect uh, without adding those. So my mentality on the piece changed a bit. Huh. Um, I still allow for those things. And I, and I think, I don't know, one could argue that it's different. Add uh, a bass note or something like that in this kind of a piece or in list, I, I sometimes do that at an, a lower octave than it would be to do that in Bach or in Mozart or or even Beethoven. You know, they were so right. specific. And I don't add notes in, in those composers. You know, why would we add it in list or in uh, Mussorgs? That's actually a really good question. Why would we? <laughs> yeah. And, and I think, I mean, it's hard. It's partly subjective. I uh -huh. think in those in those instances, somebody, somebody like Mozart, you know, to add an a lower octave. I was going to say, or what, maybe a better question is, why wouldn't we? Mm -hmm. I think it, it would change the character a lot. Um, we have to think of Mozart sonatas, let's say, being written at his time where the keyboard range was not as great. Uh, he would have had maybe a six six octave range, potentially. Right. Um, Bach is even another story because he wouldn't have even had a modern piano. He would have had maybe the early versions of what well, he did, see early versions of forte pianos, and certainly harpsichords and organs and clavichords. But... Um, the, the range was much smaller at that time, probably four and a half, five octaves. And so when Mozart writes in a certain sonata, maybe a low F, that's amazing. That would have been the lowest note on his piano or maybe the maybe he had a broadwood that he was playing on. I know Beethoven liked broadwoods a lot. Um, and and so that if we just add a lower F on our modern piano because we've got it, that, um, I don't know, it, it kind of is like, well, now that's one of our lowest notes, but it takes away from the effect that Mozart would have at his time, I well, so and, I and a, Mozart, he, he, this goes back to what we talked about before, you know, even audience or our expectations, our ears, how they change, you know, a low, a low <laughs> F, you know, sounds like nothing to us where, yeah. where to him, he couldn't have even conceived the, the, the F below that. You know? Right. Right. And, and when you get people like Beethoven that were such innovators and they pushed the piano market, actually, it's sort of, again, a chicken or egg. Thing, what which came first, the, the piece that required the lower notes or the piano that could accommodate the pieces that required the lower notes. And they kind of worked in tandem. Often Beethoven would write a piece where he had a concept in mind and he would call up Broadwood, I think John was his name, and say, hey, look, I, I have this piece and I'm thinking about it and it needs a lower note than I have on my piano or that you're making on your piano uh, or anybody, Walter pianos, for an example. And so he would design a piano that could accommodate a thicker bass ring and more tension. Now, this was before cast iron frames, of course, or the Industrial Revolution. So, yeah, I think, I mean, I, I think Beethoven was a real visionary on what what the potential the piano had. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the things he wrote were just out of, could not come from his time period. It couldn't be right, played. Right. And very, very visionary. Um, and by the way, I was we had a discussion, I remember a while back, in our first episode about Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, and, and you mentioned you know, hearing that within context uh, right. of the whole symphony, and that's part of that whole cultural milieu. And, and by the way, it's longer than I thought. You, you are more, you were correct. I, I don't imagine even that piece being on such a scale as like a Mahler symphony, and yet it was. You know, it's it was, over an he, hour. yeah. And I think of it as like his other. I've played actually. I played violin for twenty years, so I've played uh, three of his symphonies with orchestras and a one, three and five. Um, yeah. But I never play, I never performed number nine. And I always think of it as, okay, well, his other symphonies are 30, 40, maybe 45 minutes for some of the longer ones. And then all of a sudden, number nine is, you know, an hour and 15 minutes, so an hour and 20 minutes in some recording. That's another piece. I, I almost hate the fact it's become such a cliche in a way because it's such a visionary and forward thinking piece. Like nothing about that piece makes sense for when it was written. And it's yeah. so, I mean, it's, it's amazing. Um, yeah. but, and all we reduce it down to is the ode to joy. Right. <laughs> that's all we remember. I mean, there, there, that's what happens in any, any field. You, know, you can't expect everyone across, across fields and genres to remember all the details, but 
it's amazing what we reduce things down to. Right. So, so anyway, um, um yeah, well, you can get us back on track. I'm kind of. Oh digressing. yeah, well, I was just going to mention. So the the you know in in the B duo, you know, as I listen to it, you know, does have that the the it is also kind of a forward looking piece. Uh, mm-hmm. I I don't imagine and and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't imagine a lot of pieces, you know, kind of having that throbbing boom 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 with it with all the stuff that's kind of going on top. Um, it, it feels a little visionary to me. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's pretty powerful. You know, he also, Mussorgsky subscribed uh, a bit or was influenced by Tereshevsky. He's, uh, he's a philosopher and uh, he's a Russian philosopher, critic and, and nihilist. And he wrote the, a book, which I admit I haven't read, Aesthetic Relations, uh, Aesthetic Relations of Art to Reality. But he was basically, um, yeah, realist and nihilist. And, and uh, I think Mussorgsky and this new contingent of Russian composers Seeing what was going on around them, they started to subscribe as much as probably the 1960s baby boomers were starting to subscribe to certain ideologies you know, in the U.S. that were that were maybe seen as new at the time, um, and that's what uh, that's what Musorg was part of that new uh, thought movement. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of lot of cultural changes going on all over the world. I mean, mm-hmm. all over the world during that time. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, uh, then we get into this. Other promenade, so right? We're uh, we're going forward. We're still having the the promenades as interludes. Yeah, and, and it's think, again not quite as short as the last promenade, but it's it's a, it's a short one. Yeah, this is short, and and this one gets into a very high register. Um, there are some editions where the uh, it's not written an octave higher uh, in some of the parts, but I I usually play it up there. And um, it really just sets up again the next vignette, which is we come to the, the ballet. The, the ballet. Yeah. So the end of now you start to see he did this in the previous promenade going Hilary. The end of the promenades are usually foreshadowing the next vignette. They have a little bit or some of the elements. Oh so yeah. This, this one ends. You know, actually has a uh, the meters change every bar in this. It's five four six four seven four six four five four. <laughs> Seven four five four six four five four three four, um, and it finally ends he's in three the, four. He's the progressive metal composer of the nineteenth right. century. <laughs> <laughs> he finally ends in three four, which is the, the meter of the next piece, and you have yeah. a tian, 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 tian. Um, yeah, which is a just. A and I do cool. enjoy this promenade a lot. It's just, it is a delight, and it does move very beautifully into the ballet. But it, it's it's just a delight to hear the how he he how he. Uh, um, kind of shifts course into that. good at the transitions um so we get into this this is sort of a a little miniature piece it's a very short vignette um goes by quite quickly and it's based actually on these costume and uh, set design sketches that hartman did for uh, for a ballet it's called trilby or that's kind of the demon of the hearth or the elf of argyle and this was produced uh in 1871 some sources say a little bit earlier maybe 70 in st petersburg uh, and he used children from the Imperial Ballet School. And um, he uh, choreography, I'm just reading a little bit from my, my thesis here, was by probably Marin or Marin's uh, Petipa and set to the music of Julius Gerber. Uh, and so it's a it's a short story and Hartman designed sort of all the all the costumes for it. And we don't actually have any extant costumes, but we have sketches of those uh, little okay. kids in in like half shell uh, eggshells or whatever with, with uh, right. chick head, heads or whatever. That's <laughs> pretty cute. Yeah. Well, and, and, and this is, a, it's, it's short, but it's, it's funny. It's delightful. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a simple piece in a way. It's actually quite difficult to play and keep clear. Um, you know, of course, when you're having different instruments play, maybe the the ornaments on top, you can have flutes and you can have uh, maybe the strings playing the lower chords. It's one thing, but to get that sort of clarity on the piano uh, and jumping around, it's it's tough. Now, one thing I do in this piece, which I've heard, maybe it's just become a tradition. Uh, and again, we sort of have to ask, uh, ask questions of tradition. But when the, uh, so if, you, if you're looking at a score in measure five, after this opening, tian, 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 then it goes up, 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 up. It sort of has a, has a rising line. It's not quite chromatic, but uh, it's often customary to to kind of speed that up as the ticks would maybe be running around, scrambling. It's not so metered. Um, it's There's nothing marked in the score about a cello rondo or anything like that. But uh, I, I enjoy doing that maybe the second time around because there is a repeat. So Right. That's kind of fun to do. And then uh, from a technical standpoint, I'll just talk about the trio section. So this is in a ternary form. It's a scherzo trio or scherzino trio, which is Italian for a little joke. And then the trio section, and then it goes back to the um, to the scherzino. And then basically you go uh, into the next. There's a small coda, and you go right into the next uh, vignette, which, again, there's no promenade between this and the Samuel Goldenberg and Schmoyle for the next right. Next right. Piece. But um, the trio section features some trills in the right hand uh, on, with the outer fingers while you're holding uh, the thumb in most cases. Oh, so wow. Technically speaking, you know, you're, you're trilling. I usually do with two, four, alternating with two, three while holding the thumb. Uh, and then you've got some voicing issues in the left hand as well. So I hope people can and come sort of hear that when they're listening to the recording. Um, but yeah, technically, that's a big challenge. There are other things I won't get into much detail, but in my thesis where I, I kind of anticipate, it looks at anticipating Baba Yaga, which is one of the last vignettes, uh, some of the opening opening figure. Yum, yum. It's very similar to the um, sort of second section of Baba Yaga, measure 25, and where it goes, yum, 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 um, with the octaves in the left hand. Uh, it's a very similar approach there. I mean, there are other instances of this. You're not a recorder. Well, I, I do enjoy that. Like throughout the whole piece, throughout the whole work, I should say, he he, you can hear him kind of hinting and 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 um, you know giving feedback on on previous and and mm -hmm. and former or, or and future um, pieces in the in the work. It's it is it's kind of cool when you listen to the whole thing as a as a whole to to take all that in. Yeah, and I think it makes it enjoyable to listen to a second time or a third time because you start to see more of these relations uh, and right. relationships between movements. And then as piece starts, especially when you're performing it too, the piece starts be to become uh, smaller and self-contained because of all these interconnections. Mm. So, yeah, that um, makes sense. It yeah. I'll say one quick thing just because we have the opportunity to do it on this, and I'll get a little bit more technical but just looking at some of the harmonies in this piece, it seems very simple when you listen to it. But actually, uh, there's a section where it has F major with an added sixth and a ninth. And then he uh, goes to a G sharp diminished seven with an added 13th. And okay. he goes to a C sharp four three, which is a dominant of the Neapolitan. So Neapolitan is a flat two chord, usually in a first inversion. And, you know, that's a pretty interesting 
that uh, is chord progression that most most people wouldn't use, but it works, and it doesn't seem when you listen to it that, that it's that far out. Um, That's brilliant. I I would yeah. never guess that that it had that kind of harmonization going on there. Yeah, it's pretty far out. I, I would I would not come up with that on my own for sure. Man, that's yeah. cool. And and then we get right. Unless there's something else you want to add about the ballet, no. and then we get right into the Samuel Goldberg. Yeah, Goldenberg. So we go into Samuel Goldenberg and Schmoyley. Now this was um, Schmoyley. The the way it's written with uh, the umlaut over the Y. Actually, this is uh, Yiddish. Yiddish was a, a Jewish sort of derivative of German. So most Eastern European Jews. In Poland, in Germany, in, in Hungary, uh, would have spoken Yiddish. And it's inter- it's interesting just talking about that language. It's sort of a dead language today, except for in a few communities. And I got to live it very, well, basically, uh, in that community or close to it when I lived in Montreal for 11 years. So there's a oh, section wow. of town called Utkamont, and it's the... Um, it's the second largest Hasidic community outside of Israel. So Israel has the largest Hasidic community. Hasidic being the very far right. Um, right, very conservative. It's very conservative. And it's interesting because in Judaism, there is a conservative movement, of which I grew up in, that movement. And that's sort of middle of the road, but it's called conservative. So it has nothing to do with the you know, political ramifications of that. Word. Right, it's, it's conservative. religiously conservative. Right, right. Holding so to old time values and... Or the, right. their their ways, I guess. Right, and so I, I grew up. You know, I'm quite assimilated, and and you wouldn't know that. Oh, I'm Jewish necessarily. Uh, there's sort of the reform movement, and then uh, Reconstructionist is another. But then you, when you go into the very conservative movements, you have Orthodoxy, and of that Orthodoxy, Hasidism or Hasidim are the very far um, uh, Orthodox Jews. And even within the Hasidim, there are different fa- uh, facets or or sects, I could say. Um, coming from different cities in Eastern Europe. And wow. uh, the reason I say, that, say this is that in Outremont, in Montreal, all those Hasidim, those kids, their first language is Yiddish. So I used to teach students in that, uh, not in that community, but in that area. And, you know, I'd hear Yiddish was spoken on the street as if it's a living language, and it is there. How um, interesting. But only in those select communities. They're, normally their second language is in Hebrew. Of course, they're reading their prayers and in ancient Hebrew slash Aramaic and or modern Hebrew. And their third language is usually English and or French. So right. um, it was. it's interesting that I you know, I never lived in, in – I live in Albuquerque. You know, I lived in uh, Maryland. I lived in Banff. You, know, you don't have large Hasidic communities, and I wasn't next to them. Uh, and so I just thought, oh, Yiddish, that's what my grandparents spoke when they didn't want their kids my mom to understand what they were talking about. <laughs> you know, that's what we did when I grew up using Swedish. We would speak Swedish in public because nobody knew what we were talking about. Um, right. And so that's to me what Yiddish I, I learned only a few Yiddish phrases as a kid, the ones that my mom would have picked up from her, you know, from her grandparents or maybe something I was taught. But that's that's the extent of it. I have very, very little Yiddish knowledge. Um, but yeah, based on sort of German, so there's a lot of crossover. I do understand a few you know, words and sentences in German because of that, that base, that language base, and also because Swedish is a manically based language. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I love just these interconnections of language and culture. Um, oh, absolutely. It's, it, it's fascinating and how, how they intermingle. I mean, to think about, you know, uh, Yiddish being, you know, kind of this half German, half Hebrew hybrid thing going on, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this, this piece really draws on that that cultural tradition. And this is one of the few pieces. Oh, by the way, I have to tell a quick story just because um, it it cracks me up there. um, So my favorite band growing up and probably even today is Rush. I love listening to Rush and and the lead singer, bass players, his name is Getty Lee. And I heard this story and it cracked me up um, because uh, people asked like, how did you get the name Getty? Where does that come from? And -hmm. apparently it's, it's because it was all of his friends making fun of him or his, his uh, grandmother specifically because his name is Gary, but he would say, mm-hmm. Getty, Getty, come here, you know? Mm-hmm. And so he, they just started calling him Getty and he went with it. And I just think that's just a great story of, of how, you know, cool. how, how language and, and uh, 
even something simple like that, like, like I bet there's kids out there in the world whose name is Getty because of that, because of, of a grandmother who's saying Getty. When yeah. She, and then, it, yeah, because she didn't have the language yeah, or whatever. Right. To say Gary It's Gary. really interesting. Yeah. Wow. That's so interesting. Um, yeah. To, to follow that up, I have a lot of uh, Colombian friends when I studied in Montreal and you know, you can look th- these things up online. What are some interesting names? You know how people are named, and I'm not getting into celebrities naming their kids ridiculous things. But right. uh, in Colombia, it's it's not uh, uncommon to have names like One Dollar and uh, Usnavi. I was like, what is One Dollar? Well, one dollar, because uh-huh. they're so highly influenced by you know the American dollar, and that's like if your wow. name's that, it must be a good thing. You know, and then U.S. Navy. What is U.S. Navy? Well, U.S. Navy, because look, you're, they're seeing all the ships down there, you know, Panama, <laughs> you're right across there. So they of just course. see that and they see that power and like, oh, gosh, I need to name my kid that. So That's I've heard many other, yeah, many other things based on either not knowing how to read something or the language or seeing something as a status symbol or power symbol and thinking right. that's going to help your child. Um, and it's, it's interesting, the psychology of, of language. It is. It, oh, that we we could have a great discussion about that. Oh, <laughs> yeah, sure. I think sure. we already have started that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, so, so tell me about Samuel Goldenberg und Schmuel. Yeah. Schmuel. So uh, Schmueli, you could say. Schmueli. There we go. Yeah. It, it's weird, and I, it's like Shmu- actually my Hebrew name is Shlomo. It's the same root as okay. Shlomo Asher. Sh- so Shlom, Shlomi, Shmueli, Shmuel, Shmuel. They're all base um, derivatives of Sam or Samuel, which is the uh, the ancient. King, you know, in, um, oh, right. So it's like Saul, Samuel. They're they're derivatives also. Um, so this this piece basically it, it's one of the few vignettes that we have extant uh, imagery from, and we know that it's from this. So he would have seen, or Har- Mussorgsky would have seen at the exhibition of Hartman, two por- per- perhaps two portraits of Jews, and we have those two portraits. Uh, one is of a, a rich Jew, you know, with a skull cap called the kippa or the yarmulke. And a very nice overcoat, black overcoat, and um, and then the poor Jew, which he looks like he's just on the hovel. He's poor, he's tattered clothing. Um, and those are two of the images that are always published with uh, with scores of this piece. There are only about four or five images that we've got that we know about. I'll, I think I alluded to this Japanese team that went in the nineteen nineties and found some other um, right. evidence. But anyway, th- those are two of the famous ones, and. Stasov, we're talking about Vladimir Stasov, he thought that, um, or he subtitled a piece, Two Polish Jews, One Rich, The Other Poor. And that's not the original title. That's become the title in many editions. Uh, oh. And one of the great music, American musicologists, Richard Taruskin, he believed that the piece maybe represents the contrastive states of mind in one and the self-same person. That's what he says. And so... Oh. Like maybe those two photos are of two different Jews, but maybe on a psychological level, it's the the internal struggle that a Jew might have, you know. And um, so, I it, it, do you do you see that? Can you see that as a possibility as you play it? Does that does that resonate with you? Well, I certainly see the two characters. Whether you want to describe that as two different people or a schizophrenic individual, you know, that's sort of a subjective choice that the artist has to make. I don't know if that's so much. Um, Changes how you would play the piece because even if it was a schizophrenic individual or with just two two different sides to him arguing about himself, we, we all have those sides in a way. Absolutely, um, all those struggles and uh, um, you know maybe it was a Jew that was in poverty and, and grew grew to riches, or maybe it was a Jew that was rich and uh, you know squandered the money and, and went into poverty. We don't know, but definitely there are two different characters in this piece, and, uh, and they're very very clearly delineated uh, by both rhythmic, um, the rhythmic nature, also the content and uh, of, of the notes, and let's say the intervallic relationships between the notes, uh, and then the, the speed of the notes. So one thing I'll get into is just the rhythmic character. The main, let's say the rich Jew, for sake of argument, uh, starts yeah. off in his bum It's very, it's a fifth, an open fifth, which is sort of like a trumpet call. Uh, it's very... Uh, demonstrative and just very strong and kind of announces that he's there. You have to also remember that this is using the harmonic minor scale, which 
a lot of you know Arabic and Middle Eastern musics. When we think of har- harmonic minor, we think of sort of the, the snake charmer uh, right. all, and all those kinds of musics. And it really draws you into that culture as well. My my, my favorite scale is the, <laughs> the Phrygian dominant scale, which is basically the harmonic minor scale starting on the fifth. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that's cool. It's uh, I mean, you get that augmented second in there, and that's what really tears at your heart. You you uh, the whole concept behind it for those that aren't music uh, musicians, and I, I know you are obviously, <laughs> Mike, but uh, <laughs> the the seventh degree. In the natural minor scale, which borrows the same notes from the relative major minor third up. Um, so when we're talking about the natural minor, we have a whole step between the seventh degree and the eighth degree. So harmonic minor just raises that half step. So we've got a, a leading tone essentially. Uh, so in, in right. uh, like G minor, you'd have G, A, B flat, C, D, E flat, F sharp. So the distance between E flat and F sharp is a, an augmented second, not a minor third. Uh, and so that uh, that sound quality that you have in this piece, mixed with that um, rhythmic tension and, and very fast notes as well, Da-dum, the dotted rhythm, Da-dum, and then that tell the very you know, affirmative. Maybe he's he's outstretching his arm, um, and then you get the secondary character coming or the second character coming in, and that's sort of this whiny stuff. What I like to call that whiny little um, high pitch, and Maybe he's begging for money. Maybe he's begging for mercy. We don't know, but right. uh, that's that's clearly the second uh, second Jew or second mindset. Uh, and then what Musorgsky does interestingly, once he's introduced the two characters in this piece, um, he mixes them together. And so you have the bass coming in at da da, and you have the right hand in the upper register, sort of soprano register, and he makes those two rhythms coincide and work together um, and then it kind of ends almost ends in a, a bit of a if like maybe they're having some sort of tussle and 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 then there's a long rest a, pau- a pausa and it's like well who won who won the argument and then finally at the end very strong in double octaves in both hands fortissimo so clearly yeah. the uh the rich jew he you know, kind of overpowered let's say or that part of the mind over. Um, and this is another instance of an, uh, an incorrect note that, that made it through a lot of the edition, where it's C, B flat, C, B flat, and it's actually C, D flat, B flat, B flat. So oh. instead of da 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 dum, it's da 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 dum, that double note, that repeated note, adds a little bit of emphasis. And you're Which gives you that flavor, you're right. It has a bit of a skip. It's not so... It's not as smooth. Da, 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 that sound sounds more placating. Um, the da, 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 sounds much more authoritarian. Right. So, yeah, I, I think there are a lot of interesting things. This is one of my favorite pieces.
it's 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 from something that is from Hartman's expedition. Um exhibition. Exhibition, yeah. <laughs> from his exhibition. Um yeah. is, is this and and obvi- and I and I'm not one. I mean, just to be clear, I'm not one to like try to judge people from the past like on today's <laughs> standards. Mm-hmm. What obviously there was a lot of, you know, anti-Semitism stuff going on. Yeah. What is this, do you think this piece is something that he's, he's making fun? Do you think it's just a, it's a, it just a, a, a observation? Where do you think the, the motivation of maybe the piece and, and the, the work of art is based on, based on? That is a great question to bring up. And, and it's tough because, you know, at this time and throughout many different times of history, you know, Jews have been influential in some in some areas, and as a result, have been scapegoats. You know, if, if we think of where the derivations of some of the stereotypes, you know, I'll go into a little bit of history here, is that Jews are rich and they're always bankers. Um, right. Well, how did that stereotype develop? And uh, do you know how that uh, stereotype developed? Um, you actually might. I, I, I think it has to do something with they were they were the one group of people that were allowed to uh, charge interest on loans, and so they were the money lenders. That's part of it, yes. The other part is that when we go way back, you know, Middle Ages, when Islam was starting to also conquer part of Europe, and uh, the Christian, let's say, when when Rome turned Christian, you know, and then uh, that was sort of the predominant religion in Europe, uh, Christians could not deal with the quote-unquote infidels, the Islamic Mm. nation, and Muslims were not going to deal with Christian nation, but Muslims did deal with Jews. And there, there are Jews living in those areas as well. What later came to be known as Palestine, and now it's all the countries of Israel and whatever of the Middle East. And Christians right. also, though they they saw Jews as second class citizens, and we'll look in 1492, you know, with the, with the purge in um, in Spain, the Inquisition. Yeah, of course they, they were prosecuted and persecuted, but um, they could deal with them and they could sort of live amongst them. And so, if they wanted to trade. And certainly the wealthy people wanted to trade with people, uh, with the Muslims, the Islamists of the Middle East. And you know, that whole spice trade route, the, the, Silk, and, the Silk Road, um, Jews were often the, the go-between, the middlemen. And so they could deal with the merchants in uh, Muslim merchants, and then they could you know, charge a little bit of interest for, for doing all this work and right. taking it across the land and then come to Europe and a little bit of interest there so gained a lot of wealth because they were the one group that could deal with all um but anyway that came to kind of hurt them in the end because you know that that very type was put on them that money lenders and they they want to charge you interest you know up the wazoo well yeah if, if i were traveling a thousand miles with a camel back then i probably want to charge some interest too so right Back to the original question. Well, that thing, I mean, the 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 yeah. <laughs> one of the, one of the the uh, great commandments that are always broken is is thou shalt not covet, and whoever mm-hmm. has the most is going to get the get the blame for whatever other people's problems are. It yeah, seems yeah, to exactly. be exactly. Yeah, thou shalt not covet. Exactly. Um, so, to I think to get to your original question, was this piece written sort of in good faith or maybe as Part of a cultural anti-Semitism, I, I wouldn't go that far. I, of course, Russia had a lot of anti-Semitic problems at the time, and then not too long after this, you get the pogroms, uh, and my great my great grandparents actually escaped from from those areas around that time, or maybe right before, and certainly before the outbreak of the Russian Revolution in World War One. Um, so they kind of survived that, and they got lucky. But a lot of Jews didn't, and so uh, that was part of the cultural you know, aesthetic at the time. I don't, I, I think that Mussorgsky and certainly Hartman, and I have to do some research, research. I don't know if Hartman had any Jewish heritage. I mean, he had Germanic heritage, but uh, oftentimes those were, those were intertwined. There are a lot of uh, German Jews, you know, that were, that were traveling to Russia. And um, I don't know if uh, they probably had some sympathies for that culture and, and I think this is more just to to show what they thought it was. Now, of course, the, the piece is a little bit stereotypical of what a Jew might be or what they might have seen a Jew be. They probably didn't think of it as being racist or anti-Semitic. Right. They just thought, well, that's that's what Jews kind of that's- are. They're relegated to the ghettos, the actual original ghettos. 
um, when we think of World War II. You know, the Polish ghettos were some, some of the largest in Warsaw, and they were just all very poor Jews. Um, and yeah, so it's an interesting question. Uh, I think he's trying to show the nobility of it, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe the other side too, to show that, yeah, there are, in every culture, you know, that you have the great ones and you also have the not so great ones. Um, and I well, think and a lot of times you can use culture as a, a mirror in the sense mm -hmm. that, um, you know, uh, for example, if this, if this is a, 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 um, a rich man and a, and a poor man and, and what, what a better way to put it in a cultural way that everybody can quickly understand and go, okay, I see what's going on. Then to, if you make them Jewish, you know, okay, I get the stereotype. I see what, what artistically, what you're trying to do and you're, you're, you're trying to, you know, um, you, you know, not necessarily play on the stereotype, but, but you're trying to, it's, it's a cultural language that we all have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And maybe some of that uh, is we need to change. Maybe it's hard to change, but at least we're kind of aware of it. I mean, I think that's quite apropos based on what's going on today. We really have to think of these different characters and, and what our innate biases are. Like, like I said, I don't think he was trying to be anti-Semitic or even poking fun at anything, even though, Hey, we might see that uh, the whining toily uh, is a little bit poking fun, like, ah, he's just whining. But every culture is going to have right. some upstanding people you know, for the most part, and then some that are, that are maybe not, or maybe got put into that position against their will, you know. Um, for sure. So, And that's why I like Taruskin's idea, too, that this is two sides of the same person, that all of yeah. us have these internal struggles, and we've got to try to be the better, better person and not give in to you know, the, the one that covets or the, the lesser man of, or woman of us. Ain't, ain't that the truth? <laughs> let that be it. Let, yeah, let, let that go here, forth. But, you know, <laughs> that's part of yep. it. Yeah. So, so we finish up with this delightful piece and we head into the, wow, the last of the promenades. Let's talk about that for a moment. Yeah. So this is really the middle midpoint of the piece. It seems amazing. We've talked so much. This is our, right. going into our third <laughs> podcasts and yet we're just scratching the surface but this is really the middle of the piece and it brings up a lot of controversy because this is this promenade is as big as the first one and it's actually grander because he does start to fill in uh, a little bit more of the chords and it gets a little bit bigger in nature um, and it really separates this serious kind of piece from the next one which is more lighthearted the, the marketplace, basically, in Limoges, which is the marketplace in France. And so um, this particular promenade is about two and a half, three minutes. I can't remember. You probably have my CD. You can you know, say how long it is. But it's, uh, yeah, but about like, a minute and a half is what it says. But Oh, minute. Okay. So that makes sense. Minute and a half. And, uh, and a lot of – so Rimsky-Korsakov kind of cut this one, and Ravel and his orchestration cut this. So you move immediately from from uh, Samuel Goldenberg to uh, the next piece, and that's interesting. Then we get into Limoges immediately. Um, and that Why does this position, have cut it? I I don't know. Maybe he just thought it was too much, or he thought it was going back to the beginning, restarting. I think it's very important structurally to divide the piece uh, because then it kind of brings you back, like maybe other people are entering or just reminding you that this whole grand scheme of things, you know, we've, we've kind of gotten uh, lost a little bit in, in all the details and lose sight of the forest for the trees sort of thing. So this is just to say, okay, here we are again. Let's remind ourselves um, we're still on this journey together. And, well, and uh, it is kind of a, a, a pre uh, a preview or I don't know the right word. I guess preview is the right word, but it, it like it sets you up for kind of a grand finale. That's going to be the rest of this piece. Right. You know, there's yeah. there's a lot that's going on and and intertwines with the promenade in a lot of cases. But the, but but this mm -hmm. last promenade to me does feel like okay, we're entering the final act. Maybe that's the best way. Yeah, to say this it. is like going into act two, and this is the the last time where promenade is separate from the rest of the. It's like the last reality check.
to say you're you're a, a viewer of these uh, of these vignettes of this exhibition. You're not yet part of it. Um, and after this promenade, you become part of it. Uh, and so th this in a movie would be like that psychedelic moment where you start to realize maybe you are part of the Matrix, you know, or uh, maybe right. you're still an outsider. I don't I don't know. Uh, so I think it has a lot, a lot of levels, if you want. <laughs> Which you know, pill are you going to take? Right. <laughs> <Yeah. Blue or laughs> red. Um, th this one has a couple, you know, each one of these has some notes that are, that are wrong in different editions. And I mentioned the Alfred edition, which uh, the editor is Nancy Ricard, I think I'm saying that right, who, who does a wonderful job. But um, there is one point of contention here where she has, uh, it's in measure 19, there, there's a chord that she, I think, mislabels. And now that I have the original manuscript, I can see it. And it, it's very clearly, you know, uh, a different chord. You know, we're talking about either a B or a C. I'm sorry, a B flat or a C. And he wrote a B flat instead of a C, and she claims that it was a C. And hmm. it's like, really? Looking at that, that's you think that's so? It's really interesting to to do those, that kind of research. Look at all these different editions, and then look at the manuscript and uh, see how people actually interpret it over the days and and what their reasonings were. So it's not always objective. Yeah. yeah. It, it, and, and again, a transcriber versus an editor versus, you know, the composer, yeah. it all becomes kind of muddy and like <laughs> whose role is who and what yeah. are we trying to do here? Yeah, I should I should mention, sorry, on the contrary, I, I put in my thesis, the manuscript clearly I put in, in uh, it shows a C natural, not a B flat. So she was claiming, I think that it was a, that it was a e diminished e chord or something or e flat chord instead of a c major chord something like that um huh. but i i play it with the c natural uh, at least i think i do in the second recording i'm not sure in my recording which one i used uh, now that i that i recall but i used a different well one you're gonna have to listen to it on the podcast when we play it <laughs> exactly <laughs> So, and that does give me a good opportunity to to mention and thank you again. Um, we are we the the music that you're hearing in between these are courtesy of Elias and Axel Records, and and he's given us permission to to um, play these in between, so you can you can learn a little bit about each vignette and then hear it and hear what we're talking about and and maybe gain a little better appreciation for it. So thank you. Oh yeah, thanks for for playing this and and that's uh, that's from actually my first CD. There there are other pieces obviously on the CD. It's not just pictures. Uh, I think the total timing of pictures is around 32, 33 minutes. But I've got some Beethoven on there and Janáček actually I put on there. I know I mentioned him a few times, uh, and I think one of his greatest pieces is the Sonata Nuts, uh, right right before a couple pieces before pictures that exhibition. So. I urge you, if you're interested, you know, contact me. I've I've got there are plenty of CDs left. Oh yeah, go go to uh, eapeterson.com and check it, check out his his CDs. They are very good. I have two of his CDs. I need to get the third. Oh, you do. And we'll, we'll, um, yeah, I'll give you the other one. <laughs> and there's also a cool version of uh, Chopin's Revolutionary. I mean, there's there's a lot of good stuff on this one. Yeah. I thought you had, which which one uh, other one do you have the, with a violinist or the oh, other? Oh, I have to go look. I I don't know. Okay. I don't remember which one well, I have. Let me know after this. We'll figure something out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I I love here. I love listening to him. So it's, it's been it, it's been fun. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks. Okay, so we we finished through this promenade and we are headed to Limoges. Limoges. Yeah. Limoges. Limoges. Oh, we're French again. We're back yeah. to French. Limoges. Uh, it's the whole title. Limoges. Uh, Le Marché which is the market, uh, La Grande Nouvelle, so the the grand new, you know, great new. And Limoges is a city in central France. It has a very famous marketplace um, from the 19th century. It would have just had tons of people, locals, coming and trading and bartering various goods, probably food and, and pottery and other, other things. So I think this is a great uh, little vignette. It's one of the hardest. Probably overall, it's the hardest vignette. Uh, and I'm just going to read the program or programme in French. And he actually crossed this out and attempted another. another and eventually he just uh, kind of crossed out all of them. But uh, it's kind of fun to hear, hear, hear this. Yeah. So, la grande nouvelle. Monsieur Pimpant, sorry, Pimpant de Pantelé, uh, Pantelé, 
it's kind of a just using the people very often. It's kind of a funny, jovial way of bien de retrouver sa vache, la fugitive. That's it. Now, oui, madame, c'était hier. It was yesterday. No, madame, c'était avant hier. Eh bien, uh, eh bien, oui, madame, la bête rôdait dans le, uh, le voisinage. Eh bien, no, madame, la bête ne rôdait pas du tout, etc. So, basically, this is the big That's news. Great. Monsieur P- uh, Pimpant de Pante Pantaleon. He has just recovered his cow called the future. <laughs> uh, yes, madame, it was here. It was yesterday. No, madame, it wasn't yesterday. Ah, oh, good. Yes, madame, Bambo ran around the neighborhood. I could know, but I'm the animal didn't run all over. But it's just <laughs> mixed up and just crazy reporting and really silly. Uh, oh, and you fun. Hear that. Yeah, you hear that in the beginning. This just a frenzied piece. And you hear the sort of chatter that people would have uh, would have had sort of a din right. of, of sound. Um, it's very hard. This is very unidiomatic for pianists because... When we think of repeated notes or very fast staccato notes on the piano, um, you've got to use a certain type of technique uh, where you're, you're playing very rapidly and it, it's all coming back basically from your elbow. Um, like a, a jackhammer, if you can think of uh, that kind of um, physical motion that you'd have with a jackhammer, that's what you basically have to do for the piano. Uh, with other instruments, it's much easier to do repeated notes or you mm-hmm. know, like violin. You can play it tremolo with a bow and did a little, little, little on the same note. It's ex- extremely simple. Um, it's funny because when you watch these shows like uh, America's Got Talent or American Idol, they uh, always, when they have these violinists come on, they do these flat, they look like flashy things. They're actually quite simple things. Um, right. <laughs> but it looks, it, it's just very effective writing. Yeah. Uh, piano, you have other kinds of things that are flashy and effective for Repeated notes are just uh, notorious for being very difficult. Oh, they're um, so hard. Yeah. One great example is the um, the famous sonata of uh, Scarlatti, Domenico Scarlatti in D minor. I think it's K141. There's, there are many great recordings, but the one I grew up with was uh, Martha Argerich. And it's supposed to imitate sort of the strumming of a guitar. And again, strumming a guitar string multiple times, you can get very fast repeated notes. Uh, right. But on the piano, it's, it's quite difficult. So in this case, a lot of very fast... Um, we got the mercy the of the piano too, because you know the action. You're never quite sure who's going to come up. Yeah, right you're way. never you're never sure. And the left hand, you're doing these chords repeated and changing. It's just very fast, very frenzied. You almost get into it physically, um, like you're in the marketplace, you know. And your your heart, my heartbeat rises quite a bit, and my blood pressure probably goes up a lot too when I play this particular piece. Uh, it's just very difficult. Wow. So. Yeah, pretty, pretty neat. And then it, it ends in this huge flurry of uh, of just a mess of notes, kind of. Um, and then you just everybody's pausing. confused about the cow. Yeah, everybody's <laughs> right. Everybody's running around. Where was the cow? It was here? It wasn't there. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. And then uh, so another piece that he was kind of influenced a bit by in this in this writing when we think of repeated notes, uh, which is in some circles considered the hardest piano piece ever written, or at least romantic piece, is Balakirev. He was uh, other, one of the other Mogul Chakuchka, one of the Russian five. He wrote a piece called Islame, Oriental Fantasy. And that is an extremely difficult piece. Uh, and I, I've performed it a number of times. And it's just very, as soon as you start that, it's like, oh boy, here we go. You know, um, and it has tons of repeated notes. Oh, wow. And, uh, and so similar kinds of techniques. Uh, for that, that's a that's a harder piece for sure. But um, a lot of Russians yeah. use this too. Petrushka servant uses a lot of repeated notes too. Maybe not. Well, and it's that. interesting because you you also um, you see that mo- like a, a lot of. Um, you know, a lot of times, like even like modern jazz players, you know, they'll play the, but they'll play it like on the offbeat. And so you uh-huh. have this, instead of having the da 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 da, it's da 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 da, you know, and it has more of a galloping effect, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he does actually, Mussorgsky does that a little bit. I'm glad you brought that up. And the first time he has this descending scale pattern, he has the accents, uh, let's see, on the first beat and then on the middle. And then middle, and then first, and then when he does it later, he does first beat, first beat, middle beat, middle beat, middle beat. So 
it kind of throws you off if you're, and it's very hard to pull that off in performance and actually have people recognize that there's a difference. But um, when you're listening, it's da 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 and the other one, it's it's a little different. Um, your, your meter is thrown off a little bit. Your stasis is thrown off. So pretty cool. 